All right, you ready? All set. Very good. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Gross Point Historical Society's third Dr. Frank Bicknell lecture of the 2021 season. As a result of the ongoing pandemic, this is once again a virtual online program. We appreciate your attendance. The Gross Point Historical Society series is named in honor of Dr. Frank Bicknell, his daughter, and here you see a photograph of Dr. Bicknell from the early 1970s. His daughter and son-in-law created society's Dr. Frank Bicknell Trust Fund to mark Dr. Bicknell's 80th birthday in 1987. Dr. Bicknell attended these programs until his passing in 1999. I'm Mike Skinner, chairperson of the society's Bicknell committee. The other members of the committee are fellow members of the boards of the society's board of trustees, and Adam Hellebuck and Susan Lewandowski. They're both with us, with us tonight. Appreciate uh, all their work. And Adam is this evening's moderator handling the technical issues relating to this online program, which will be recorded and available on the Gross Point Historical Society's YouTube channel. Thank you, Adam. We look forward to returning to in-person programs when we reach the new normal, hopefully sometime in 2021. But as of right now, it appears that all of the 2020-2021 lecture series, which runs from September through May, will remain virtual online programs. Meanwhile, we hope that you will consider supporting the Gross Point Historical Society's year-end appeal and its capital campaign as the society raises funds to build its new administration and collections resource building, uh, which will be built across Kirchwell from the society's circa 1823 Provencal Warehouse Museum, which you see here. Now let me describe the spring programs before this evening's speaker. As many of you know, the lectures are held in September, October, and November, and then we come back in March, April, and May. And that was really uh, because we, we used to have winter programs and we have snow issues and so on. Now that we're all watching from home, I suppose we could change that, but we haven't this year. Uh, the first of these spring programs is on March 17th, or again, they're all on Wednesday evenings, third Wednesday of the month at 7.30 p.m. And it's entitled Detroit Civil War Sites and Stories and is based on a, a section of the Arcadia Publishing His History Press book, Michigan Civil War Landmarks. You see the image there to the left. When America faced its greatest internal crisis, the Detroit area answered the call with thousands of volunteers, including many from Gross Point Township. During this presentation, we'll learn more about the abolitionists, uh, politicians, soldiers, regiments, events, monuments and statues and graves in and around the city, which relate to the American Civil War. The evening's presenter will be David Engel, who co-authored this book. Next, is the um, Wednesday, April 21st to uh, 2021 program entitled Gross Points Real Estate Point System and Ethnic Diversity in the Community During the 1960s. Uh, Kathy Aladacidi, the author of the 1972 book Gross Point Race versus Race. Uh, many of you may know her as Kathy Groen. Uh, for those of you that knew she was a 1963 graduate of Gross Point High, now Gross Point South. And the second book, uh, published in September of this year, The Fort, Growing Up in Gross Point during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and the author of that book, Doug Vreeland, will be the other presenter. This program will mark the 55th anniversary of the first African-American family purchasing a house in the Gross Points, which by the way, a straw buyer had to be used uh, because otherwise they would not have been allowed to, to purchase. And the 50th anniversary of the elimination of the community's appalling real estate point system uh, that um, uh, was the reason for an African-American family not being able to purchase. This point system was utilized to keep certain ethnic groups from moving into the gross points. This program will also uh, uh, briefly deal with gross point and Detroit tension uh, between the gross points and Detroit in the 1960s and Dr. L uh, Martin Luther King's speech at Gross Point High School three, three weeks before his assassination in 1968. Last, but certainly not least, the Wednesday, May 19th, 2021 lecture will feature the new Arcadia publishing book, Grand Estates of Gross Point. Uh, and you see the image of that uh, to the right. Uh, being held during Preservation Month, the May program will once again, uh, now for 20 years, be co-sponsored by Gross Point's greatest example of historic preservation, the Etzel and Eleanor Ford House. Uh, back to the book itself, this book is filled with photographs that illustrate the fact that during the early 20th century, Gross Point transitioned from a summer retreat for wealthy Detroit families to a year-round home for prominent professionals who hired the finest architects money could buy 
to design and build grand mansions. By the 1930s, massive Georgian, Tudor, and other classically designed residents were commonplace. Finally, tonight's program, uh, we will be featuring the Arcadia Publishing History Press book, w Wicked Women of Detroit, which was published in 2018, and will describe some of Detroit's most violent, clever, and misunderstood female criminals. The author and tonight's presenter is Tobin Book. And Tobin and I were just talking about the fact that it's great he's written all of these books on these interesting, ghastly uh, topics, and that his last name rhymes with spook, but it's B-U-H-K, pronounced book. Uh, he describes himself as the connoisseur of crime, a gourmet of the ghastly, an aficionado, uh, 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 aficionado of the atrocious, and a fanatic of the felonious and a maven of misdeeds. He's been featured as an expert on the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum, uh, and tonight's topic is his 10th book, and here we are just two, day, two years later, he's working on his 14th book. Tobin grew up in Wyoming, Michigan, near Grand Rapids. He possesses an MA in English from Michigan State and an MA in Educational Leadership from Western Michigan University. He's been a classroom teacher for 26 years and is currently a high school teacher at Forest Hills Central High School in Ada, Michigan, near Grand Rapids. He and his wife have two daughters and live in Jensen, Jenison, Michigan, and Tobin added that he has two standard poodles. So I guess with the children growing, um, uh, the dogs are your children at this point. So they they are, uh, they are my children. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Book uh, and turn it over to uh, Tobin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skinner, uh, for that that those kind words. Um, before I begin tonight, let me uh, let me just take a minute before I take uh, say one more word, take one more step. Let me thank all of my new friends at the Gross Point Historical Society for hosting me this evening, um, Mr. Skinner, for that fine introduction. My only regret is that I I, I can't um, have the adventure of coming over there to to see you all in person. Um, but hope, uh, hope springs eternal and, and perhaps the next time I visit the Gross Point Historical Society, it will be, it will be live, which would be uh, my preference. Now, um, yeah, so people often ask me what I, why I'm doing writing all these books about crime. And, you know, my standard answer is you don't have to look very far. You just notice what I do for a living. I'm a teacher. So, uh, spend all day with adolescents and, and, you know, go home and write about crime at, at night. It seems it's a wonderful cathartic. I've been doing it for, for a long time. Um, so as Mr. Skinner mentioned, I've, I've, I've had 12 books published and, and now I'm on 13 and 14. So it's going to be kind of a busy year for writing for me. And it's all crime based stuff. Um, the one I'm working on right now is, is Michigan based and I'm kind of excited about that. That should be coming out in uh, June or July. And the other one is more of a national uh, kind of thing. It's not Michigan based, but it's historical and it's kind of along the line of, of crime. So um, before I, I start the slideshow, I have two caveats for the audience tonight. Um, first of all, none of you are in the book, <laughs> but, but there could be a sequel. So uh, two, uh, gentlemen, you are here at your own risk. I'm gonna be talking about some pretty felonious females here and, and the women in, in my audiences usually ask some pretty provocative questions about doing away with people. So, you know, uh, funny, funny story, I was given this presentation over in the, in the uh, Eastern side of the state thumb area and uh, older lady had come with a gentleman and in the middle of the presentation, she raised her hand, asked, asked a question, it was the cutest thing. And she said, so what you're saying is, I can mix the arsenic in coffee and it won't taste so bitter. <laughs> and the man she was with, his eyes got like, like dinner plate size, you know, deer in headlights. And he kind of looked at her and kind of stepped back. And so, um, yeah. So we're gonna talk a little bit about poison and arsenic. So gentlemen, um, that's, uh, that's my forewarning to you. So let me get started with the presentation. I'm and if I may, Tobin, I, and I promise I will not interrupt again. That brings up a good point. There is a chat feature on Zoom. I think all of you know that. Um, you'll be typing in your questions, and I will be reading them at the end. Uh, so um, if you can ask questions uh, uh, at any time, uh, but we're going to do a question and answer session at the end of the program. Good, Tobin. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. So let's go ahead and share. Um, 
bring up my presentation here. And uh, if Mike, you could tell me real quick whether the presentation looks like it's good to go. Yep, yep. It, uh, Taylor Swift is showing. No, I'm just yeah. we were joking about that earlier. Uh, you can explain that cover. That's not Taylor Swift, obviously. Her hands no. are too old. No, this is a this is an old uh, magazine, crime, mag true crime publication from the pulp era. I think this is 19 early 1940s, maybe. And uh, I kind of took the masthead off and I put the Wicked Women of Detroit on there. And the model does look uh, amazingly familiar, but but uh, but we don't know her. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with this uh, particular slide. Now, I'm going to I'm going to talk for roughly about an hour. And after that, there's like a Zoom Teague that 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 kicks in and and I'll start to lose audience members. And I probably won't get through everything because I got quite a bit of stuff to talk about. I could talk for a couple hours, but um, then <laughs> then I'll become a crime victim. You know, uh, you'll be looking to do away with me. So just go for about an hour and then and then I'll open it up to whatever questions you might have. And uh, and then if you're interested in ordering a copy of, of one of my books, I have, I have several. Um, then uh, I'll tell you how to proceed with that. My interest in, in Wicked Women of Detroit, really, really the most dangerous women in Michigan, uh, comes from this page. This is a 1910 a U.S. Census page of the Detroit House of Corrections, the old one in the Eastern Market area, not, not the newer one that was in the, the Northville area. Now, any serious study of female offenders in, in Michigan in this era, that would be the late 1860s, until the, the 1926, the height of the Roaring Twenties, all roads lead to the old Dehoko, Detroit House of Correction. And the reason for that is, is it was the only facility in the state of Michigan, the only one that held long-term female inmates. Now it also held short-termers from Detroit. Um, it also held male prisoners, and for a while it held federal prisoners. Bell Star and her son and her, her husband Sam Star. The famous outlaw bandits uh, did time in Detroit for horse theft, but uh, that that didn't last real long, and it, it pretty much became a state prison. And Jackson, in, in very earliest years, had had uh, held women prisoners, but for the most part, um, that wasn't true. There was one lifer that remained in Jackson, but they were all transferred to the House of Correction. And during that 60, 70 year period of time, this is where they wound up. Now, what's interesting about this page is this is an all inclusive page. Every woman that was doing a sentence long enough to call the old Dehoko home when the census takers came knocking is in this page. And what's kind of shocking about that is that if I showed you this uh, similar, you know, pages of the, the Detroit uh, for the Jackson State Penitentiary, it would be pages and pages and pages, and there'd be many, many more lifers. And, and, and the Marquette State Penitentiary was open in 1889, so there would have been census records for that as well, and it'd be pages and pages and pages. Uh, this one is just one page, and of these women, most of them are shorter sentences. I mean, this is these are all the women in in the Hoko in 1910, but um, there's only five lifers on this page, and and for that period of time that I mentioned, the 1860s to the 1920s, that's about right. Um, so I, the the thing that really took me to this page is the last name on the list, Mary McKnight. Now I won't be talking about her really tonight. I wrote a book about her. She hailed from Fife Lake area, and she was known as the Michigan Borgia, which is really probably an insult to Lucretia Borgia, to be honest with you. She killed as many as 11 people. Some people say 14. I've found research indicating 11, all with strychnine, which is a weird substance to use for this, for murder. Um, it does the trick, but it leaves a telltale clue that can't be mistaken for anything else. I'll tell you a little more about that later on. Um, most of them children. So she's really kind of like, a I think, nurses who kill. Moving up the list. We have uh, a woman named Mabel Larson. Her real name was Corin Larson. Lifer killed uh, killed a handyman for life insurance policy. Jenny Flood, the, the Michigan, the uh, Grand Rapids shotgun slayer. Above her, we have Nellie Pope, who, in my humble opinion, is one of the wickedest women in Detroit history, um, axe slayer. And then above, uh, second from the bottom, we have Sarah Quimby, who uh, poisoned her own children. And uh, so that's it. Five lifers in in in, in the Dehoko in 1910, and so that that kind of raises an interesting question: Why comparatively fewer female lifers than male? Because, like I said before, the Jackson records indicate that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of men serving the full Monty, if you will. All right. So part of the reason why, big part of the reason why, 
is this picture that's at the bottom right hand side. This is a um, old cabinet photograph. And if you look at the bottom, they're numbered. The, the men are numbered. These guys with uh, some really enviable facial hair. Uh, this picture taken in 1889, same year that Jack the Ripper was doing his thing in, in the East End of London. And this is your the numbers give it away. There's 12 numbers. There's 12 men. This is your prototypical jury of the era. Um, women were not allowed to serve on, on juries until they achieved citizenship, which was defined by suffrage. The suffrage in Michigan, uh, the law really took effect in 1920. Michigan was slow on the uptake. It was in the mid-20s before the first female juror was, was um, on the jury, and that was Wayne County. And then it was a couple of years after that. It was well toward the end of the decade of the 1920s when women regularly sat on juries. Now, you would think that in, a, in, in an era where the legal system was, uh, one could say, by today's standard, chauvinistic, you would think that an all-male jury like this would be hideously prejudiced against a female defendant. Uh, and, but in fact, the opposite was true. It was said that a manipulative it was said that a male juror inevitably saw a female defendant as a woman in his life. She represented to him a mother, a sister, an aunt, a daughter. And therefore, with a really good sob story, uh, that defendant could rigor her way out of some really, really serious trouble. So the all-male juries is, is one of the reasons why there were comparatively few, fewer females doing real, real long-term sentences. Not the, only, not the only reason why, but it's kind of a big one. And a lot of these con artists came out and said that they were absolutely terrified, terrified of the female juror because they could no longer pull on the heartstrings like they would have been able to do before. Um, now, whenever I write a historic book and, and Wicked Women in Detroit would, would qualify in this, I have to remind myself that 21st century law and order, my, my world is different than their world. Um, and in some cases, drastically so. And the farther you go back in U.S. history, the, the more so this is true. I wrote a book on criminology in the Civil War, and the, the, the law and order, the legal system during the 1860s was really far out. Um, military trials, the prosecuting attorney was also the defense attorney. You know, it's, you know, things like that that would never fly in, in, in today's jurisprudence. Sometimes what was a crime yesterday isn't the crime today and sometimes vice versa. No. There's an old saying, rule of thumb, and the, the derivation of that expression isn't exactly clear, but one, one possibility is that it came from a, a 19th century moray that a husband could beat his wife as long as the stick he used was no thicker in circumference to, than his thumbs, rule of thumb. Now, you look at my thumbs, all right? I mean, you know, you know I don't have big hands, don't judge me, but you, know, you can imagine a stick that thick is going to wield some really deadly force. Now, today, we'd call that spousal abuse, and that would be rigorously prosecuted in any jurisdiction. But back in the 1890s, you know, that was, that was, those were the rules of the game. So what is a crime today wasn't a crime back then. Now, if you're looking at a wanted poster from Highland Park on the left-hand side. This is a good example of what was a crime then and isn't anymore. And it's spousal abandonment. Adam, I'm sorry. Uh, or I'm sorry. Uh... Tobin, we have an advance. We're still on. It was a man's world. Yeah, we're. You, so you're looking at you're. No, we haven't. Okay, yet. so Highland Park Department wanted. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, that's Let's okay. You're talking about that. That's all right. Yeah, I'm. I'm talking about this. This wanted poster with this mustachioed fellow. Okay. So, um, t today, to be fair, uh, a lot of jurisdictions have on the books. Uh, it's still a crime to abandon one's spouse, but. We have something today that they would have never understood, and that's the concept of gender equity and all kinds of employment, all employment opportunities are open to males and females in theory, in theory. Back then, that wasn't the case. In 1919, when Willard Guy, so Willard Guy, a little bit about him. He came to Detroit with his wife, Irene. They were in their 50s. He came to Detroit uh, in the teens, took a job, like a, like a lot of people, he took a job with Ford Motor Company, so the pay was good. And... Uh, he left his wife, Irene, high and dry in 1919 and, and, and left her destitute. She didn't have the kind of employment opportunities that she would have had if she was alive in the 21st century. So Irene went, went desperate. She went to the Highland Park police chief, Charles Seymour, who, by the way, was the first local cop to use fingerprint classification. 
Uh, and Seymour swore out in a warrant for this man's arrest on the crime of spousal abandonment. Now, there's a, uh, interesting, there's a line, and you're not probably going to be able to see it, but there's a line toward the bottom where we're given a clue as to what happened to Willard. And it, it says he may be found with a woman who is not his wife. So Willard had what my grandmother would have called a, a zipper problem. Um, they, they caught him. Um, they, they dragged him kicking and screaming back to Irene, who I like to think walloped him in the eye, gave him a great big black eye, and then, you know, gave him a stake for it like they did in the old days. Interestingly enough, um, they lived happily. Well, I don't know how happily it was for, for Willard, but they lived together for the rest of their lives. Um, they died one, one month apart in 1926. Kind of an interesting story. And there, there's a little bit more to it. And then I can tell you where you can find that out a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, okay. This, this photograph here that you're seeing that I'm using for the background of my presentation is the old Detroit House of Corrections. It's an old stereo view photograph. It's the only interior shot I've ever seen. Um, Notice the cell block, the high arch windows of the cell block. This would have been facing due east because the prison was constructed before the electric light bulb. And so the idea was is that the sundowners would come in and at least give them some light from the rising sun. Although this is Michigan, so there are certain months where that really doesn't happen. But um, you notice the cell, the cells themselves, the ornate uh, cell uh, uh, iron work. Before it became the Motor City, Detroit was well known for its iron foundries. And they had a couple of manufacturers of iron things that uh, like, like the one that made prison cells for all the prisons all over the United States was situated right in Detroit. So industry leader, and it was called E.T. Barnum, which is kind of ironic because, you know, the great showman P.T. Barnum, but it was E.T. Barnum, Edward Barnum, and they weren't related in any way, shape or form. Now, it's kind of interesting that they got this image when there is nobody milling about. And the reason for that is, is that when women and, and any prisoners were um, sentenced, they were sentenced to whatever years at hard labor, which meant they worked in the prison shops, which is where they undoubtedly were when they take this, took this image. So um, here we have the Detroit Homicide Squad, all six of them, in about 1910 how times change. But again, this is before Detroit reached a, became a million person metropolis, which I believe happened in about the year 1920. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that's about when it became uh, about a million people. So the crime rate wasn't quite as severe as you would think in 1910. Now, the most interesting person, a couple of interesting features of this photograph, one is the camera in the middle. This would have been used for mug shots for identification purposes. The suspect had to hold a pose for a little while like, like they did in the old days. And another really interesting thing about this is, is the matron. Her, you wouldn't believe how hard it was for me to identify her. You know, people, criminals from this era, I mean, people know the names, you know, but when it comes to the law, the, the law keepers, these people tend to fall right through the cracks of history, which is very sad. Whenever I write a book, it's kind of fun to try to pull them back into the light. And you, you wouldn't believe how hard it was to just identify her. Her name was Clara Langerink. And she would have uh, played a vital role in all of this because no self-respecting police officer would ever question a female suspect um, without her present um, and, and, and behind closed doors. They, they questioned male suspects in their cells. A lot of times these guys walked in and they limped out because they had a close encounter with a truncheon or a blackjack or a rubber hose. They never treated females this way. Females were usually um, interviewed in the police chief's office with the matron present and in full view of the public, which meant that news reporters were allowed to sit in on the interrogations and even ask questions. Newspaper reports, so, so, for, so for researchers like me, that adds an interesting layer to the historical record that you would never get with a male suspect. These newspaper reporters would ask questions and then they would print, um, a lot of times they'd trip up the, the suspects and lies and uh, kind of like junior G-men really. And, and then they would print transcripts of this stuff in the newspaper. It's really fascinating. Um, never get that with the guys. Now, behind Clara here is the Detroit's um, rogues gallery. And an early identification system consisted of 11 or 12 bodily measurements, depending on which, which jurisdiction you're in, and a mugshot, which was a full frontal and a, and a side. And a lot of times it was a third. It was a full frontal with a hat on so that if the prisoner escaped, then uh, you might be able to recognize the person with his with his hat on. Um, the biggest rogues gallery. So what they did is they mounted these photographs on cards. Think of index cards, and they put the bodily measurements on the backside, and then uh, they kept them. Sometimes they published them and sent them to other jurisdictions. If you had a you know a, a tri-state con artist, for example, and uh, 
The biggest rogues gallery in the United States was San Francisco by, uh, I'm sorry, Chicago by far. Chicago PD number two is San Francisco. And Detroit wasn't even, even close because it just didn't have that kind of crime rate those other cities did. In fact, the, uh, the rogues gallery of Detroit consisted of just the three cabinets behind Clara Langrink. And you can kind of see the three cabinets only have what, you know, maybe 30 photographs, 30 cards in each. So we're not talking about a real big, you know, uh, group of people here. Now, this gives me an opportunity to introduce you to the first wicked woman of Detroit, which uh, is a little buildup necessary for this. Um, her name was Ismaniah Martin, or Ismay for short. She was a teenage con artist, and if Ismay had decided to go into vaudeville, she would have made an absolute fortune because she was kind of a gifted ingenue. She had a very, very interesting M.O., she would go through city directories of Detroit and she would pick somebody with the same surname, preferably somebody from the affluent group or, or somebody who uh, was an upstanding citizen. She kind of adopt that persona and then she would use that to ingratiate herself in with high society in another city. So she goes to the, it's 1897 and she goes to the De Detroit city directory and she comes across the name John T. Martin. She adopts his name and she goes up to Grand Rapids, where I'm from. I'm speaking to you from a southwest suburb of GR right now. And uh, she told everybody she was the daughter of John T. Martin, who happened to be the police chief, the superintendent of police of Detroit. And, and everybody figured, OK, with that kind of credibility, she's not going to cheat us. So she went up to Heritage Hill, where the where the affluent lived, and she sold them life insurance policies that didn't exist and, and bicycles that that didn't exist. In fact, she supposedly, you know, the gifted saleswoman, she created a run on bicycles. Every society woman wanted to have a, uh, a wheel, a big wheel, they called it. Now, Ismay had a sixth sense for feeling the heat. So when John T. Martin discovered he was being used this way, he sent a squad up to Grandpa's catcher. She fled with a great big fat wad of greenbacks. Went down to Cincinnati, where she started the scam all over again. She used a different Martin from Detroit. Now, this time, though, she chose unwisely. She chose a Martin from Detroit who happened to be friends with the people she was trying to con in Cincinnati. They exchanged letters and she, her goose was cooked. She got arrested and taken to the Cincinnati police uh, uh, station where they, the, they're going to take a photograph of her. But she had some type of a pathological fear of the camera and we don't want to sit and still for the camera. The photographer was afraid she was going to tear up his whole studio. He said that trying to get her in that chair was kind of like wrestling a cat into a bathtub of hot water. She didn't want to, the cat doesn't want to go in the water. Ismay didn't want to sit for the photograph. Finally, I think she got kind of tired of, of fighting it. She sat for the photograph. And when the photographer said, hold your pose, this is what she did. She made a clown face, which rendered the photograph unusable for, for, identification purposes. They didn't even try to make a, a profile shot. So Ismay went to Grand Rapids for the trial and the photograph, the mugshot actually wound up going to Washington, D.C., where it got to be part of the uh, uh, national, not the National Archives, the Library of Congress's collection. I have no idea how how or why it got there, but, but it did. So Ismaniah stood trial in 1897, the great bicycle trial of Grand Rapids, and she was sentenced and found, uh, tried, found guilty and sentenced to seven and a half years in the Detroit House of Corrections, which was a really rough place because of Nellie Pope, which we'll get to her in a minute. And uh, Ismaniah's weight plummeted. The superintendent, the, the warden of the, the Dehoko, a guy named Nicholson, was afraid she was going to die behind bars. And so he pushed for a parole and she was let out early after a couple of years. Ismay, true to form, made a beeline straight to Mackinac Island where all the affluent tourists were. She was gonna basically set up a con there and, and they caught her coming off the boat, kicked her off the island. So she was burned everywhere. She decided to go straight, which meant that she became a reporter for the Detroit Free Press. Um, now, now, when she died, the newspaper ran a glowing obituary of her, but they didn't say anything about her life before she became a reporter. Uh, she never married, never had children. And she became just very dedicated and a, and a, a very, very good uh, news correspondent. And the press didn't want to talk about her, 
her life before that. And the great bicycle trial was just one in, in, in many. There was an interesting story where she uh, conned the guy at the at the, the uh, train station in downtown Detroit out of a free ticket. Here's Carrie Pearlberg. This is a straight from Chicago's rogues gallery. You can see this is a typical rogues gallery mugshot card. And I like to show Carrie Pearlberg, who was a pickpocket, pickpocket con artist extraordinaire. She a uh, shoplifter. She had sticky fingers. She liked to steal stuff from Highline department stores, Carson Perry Scott, um, and Marshall Fields, places like that. And uh, I like to show this particular photograph because she is a really good example of how a manipulative woman could really tug on the heartstrings of an all-male jury. When she got caught, she rented a baby for the trial. That's right. You heard me right. She rented a baby for the trial. The idea was she was going to hold this babe up for the jurors, and a very powerful piece of visual rhetoric that, you know, if they send her to prison, what's going to happen to the child? And it worked. She got in real trouble that time. It worked the first time. She tried it a second time and it didn't work the second time, but that's a really good example. And, and, and when, when female jurors started to go into the jury box, people like Carrie Pearlberg were absolutely terrified because that visual rhetoric wouldn't work so easily on, on the women. This is the back side of the card. A couple more mugshot cards. Um, these are really upstanding Michiganders. Uh, they're both from Detroit, uh, both check kiters, which is a kind of a, a, a kind of a nomenclature for check forgers before they had security paper. The woman on the right hand side, it's the same woman. Uh, the bottom one is her mugshot that was taken in 1914. And the top one, she got caught a second time, 1915. You notice that that one year has not done Evelyn Winifred any favors. And this is just generally technically how these bodily measurements worked as an identification. They call it the Bertillon system. Um, the idea was is that these measurements couldn't be uh, hidden or faked really easily. One of them is height, one of them is girth, um, those type of things. So when you have somebody whose appearance has been so drastically changed in one year, the idea was that the bodily measurements were going to give her away because they'd be identical, in which case they were. And that's kind of how she got caught. The bottom one is um, San Francisco. The top one is Oakland, California, other side of the bay. And uh, that second time she got caught, they put her in San Quentin for a while. So, the, you know, she, she had been a kind of a habitual felon. By the way, the hat that she's wearing, it's called the Merry Widow's Hat. It was all the rage in the teens to get these things as big as you possibly could. I've seen them with stuffed parrot on them. Uh, and, and, and this one she's wearing is actually kind of small. They got to be so big that Detroit has to, had to pass a city ordinance because women were bumping into guys with these things. The city ordinance said that these hats had to, it limited the, the circumference of these hats to eight feet, eight feet in circumference. It's an amazingly large hat when you think about it. So lots of stories of, of uh, women in, in court because uh, trials were very, very popular. I mean, that was the best drama in town, better than vaudeville, better than anything, unexpurgated you know, uh, testimony. You might even hear a madam get up and, and talk about what went on behind closed doors. I've done trials like that, research cases like that. And so these, these trials were very popular. And there was always a, a, an aisle uh, for women. And, and lots of times you hear reporters complaining because they have to crane their necks to see over these merry widow's hats because they were just so huge, so large. Um, okay, so Here's what the X, you know, it's unfortunate this building didn't survive because it's a very majestic structure. When it was built in the 1860s, uh, this is really what was characterized as the Victorian era. And people were very, very interested in the CD side of things, um, but they weren't, they didn't necessarily want to admit that they lived amongst them. And so a lot of times these prisons, and this is especially true of county jails, were, uh, sort of built to look like uh, more majestic structures. So if you look at, you know, the, the, the trees lining the boulevard kind of cover up the cell block and the superintendents, the, the warden's residence where Nicholson would have lived. If I put a, a mansion from Detroit from this era next to it, they'd be indistinguishable. So the windows you're looking at, you can kind of see the cell bars. These are those high arch windows. So we're standing, looking west here. 
because the windows would have been facing east. It, it was a whole block. There was those the superintendent's residence and then the two wings jutting out from each side. And then there was a square yard in the back. Now, um, these are female inmates from uh, Sing Sing prison. And there's a reason why I'm showing you a New York image here. Uh, first of all, pay attention to their clothing. Uh, it's very typical prison uniforms, no stripes um, or dresses. Uh, now, here are the other prisoners. Now, so what's interesting about this, okay, you see that image, you see that image, part of the same series, and you'll see that these women are in the background here. The reason why I wanted to show you this is because in Sing Sing, in every prison in the United States for women in this era, prisoners were strictly segregated. The black inmates and the white inmates did not mix. In fact, they wouldn't even let them get close to one another when they took the photograph, except in Detroit. Here's the only image I've ever seen of the Detroit, uh, the women from the old Dahoko. These are the wickedest women in Detroit. This image dates from 1899. Um, and this is a fascinating, fascinating image for a couple different reasons. First of all, you can see the high art cell block windows and you can see that our, our you know, Michigan's in, inmates were uh, not segregated. Michigan has, and, and particularly in, in the Eastern part of the state, a long, very honorable history with, with not segregating things. And I think that it comes from the fact that Detroit was uh, station number one on the, on the on the western route of the Underground Railroad. You know, there have been, to be, to be true, several race riots in the city. Uh, but when you look at racial, racial politics and, and racial relations in other cities of the era, there are some things about Detroit that were very, very progressive. And one of them, one, one small piece of that would be the integration of the inmates here. Um, now, the very, the woman in the very back here uh, behind the matron is Nellie Pope, I think, but I can't prove it because it's really grainy. And I, I reference her again, and we'll, we'll come back to that. The woman in front of her is the, the jailhouse matron or guard. Notice she's wearing black when it was popular, not just for funerals. You know. um, notice their prison uniforms. You can see that they're clearly not segregated. The woman who is, one of the most fascinating pieces about this photograph is the woman who's standing forth from the right. She don't want to be photographed, but it didn't really have much of a chance, a choice. She's making a tremendously naughty gesture to the cameraman, which would be kind of like our middle finger. She's doing this, you know, she's touching her end of her nose with her index finger. And that's, that's what that is. Um, all the women who, who all the, the really serious offenders who went into the Dihoko, the lifers, uh, were sentenced to two weeks of solitary confinement right away. Um, it was a preemptive measure. Uh, it, it, for women, and I think this might be true for all lifers, but for women, particularly the first year they're in is the hardest year. This is when they get caught in a lot of fights. They get caught going over the wall. Um, I did uh, some writing about a serial killer named Diane Spencer, who's uh, in the Huron Valley Correctional Institute institution now. And I interviewed one of the guards and, and I understand that she had a hard time that first year. She got caught trying to escape, got into fights. And that may have something to do with the fact that they're facing the inevitable inevitability that they're never coming out. I don't know. But the old Dehoko, one, one, reason, one reason or another, they, they, they threw their lifers in solitary right off the bat. And it might have been a way, it might have been the, the warden's way of saying, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't follow the rules. I don't know. Preemptive measure, I, I think. So the women who were sentenced to life in prison were sentenced to 20 years with the possibility of parole. It's not like it is today where they go on the never, never list. And it was always a sentence at hard labor. So what that meant is they worked at one of the prison industries. Now, the, the bread and butter prison industries of the old Dehoko were caning chairs, putting cane, cane backs on chairs and carding buttons. They didn't make the buttons. They sold them on the card so they could be purchased that way. And this is an image I've never seen, ever, ever seen this photograph. There, there must be a photograph of it someplace, but I don't know. So I had to go with a sketch. And again, you can see that the prisoners are integrated. That's pretty clear in the, the, the image here. Um, you see the buttons on the, on the table. Now, you would think that if we were to be, you know, go back in the time machine and actually witness this, you'd be hearing what idle gossip, you know, maybe arguments, jokes being told, uh, 
you know, people talk about, you know, uh, chatter, idle chatter. But in this case, all you would be hearing is the shuffling the buttons on the table, kind of like miniature poker chips, because the women were not allowed to talk with one another. They were they were um, issued orders to follow a strict silence rule. And this was not just true in the old Dahoko. This was true in women's prisons all over the United States, that there was the silence rule. If they broke it, they went straight to solitary and they the, the, the lifers had already experienced that. They didn't want, you know, want that. So for the most part, this would have been a pretty, pretty quiet place. Now, this is always a little bit kind of surprising. I mentioned that there are comparatively very few female lifers. Well, I started, I thought that list in 1910, you know, I, I'd studied and wrote a book about Nellie Pope. I thought to myself, all these other women must have really fascinating stories uh, behind them. So I started researching and I uncovered that from the 1860s to the mid 1920s, there were only 34 women who were sentenced to life in prison, only 34. That's nothing compared to the male population, which is dozens and dozens and dozens. Now, 20 years of the possibility of parole. A lot of these women didn't spend 20 years because it was political ca political cachet for governors uh, to, to who wanted to appear that they weren't so hard on crime to parole uh, female lifers. Now, I'm only going to cover this is Wicked Women of Detroit. I have another presentation called Michigan's Most Dangerous Women, where I go over some of these other cases. I'm only going to cover the Detroit cases here, um, given the fact that that's kind of what the presentation is now. But but this list, how I set this up, is, and, and you won't find this anyplace else. This is, uh, you wouldn't believe how many stones I pulled up to find this. Um, and, and some of these, despite the fact that these are all headline crimes, some of these cases, like number four, um, very, very hard to find any information on. In fact, number four is interesting. Um, that's in my neck of the woods. The only, the only female arsonist I've ever heard of. Um, so just 34 women anyways, and uh, how I set this list up is the name, um, the county, and the dates of incarceration, the uh, disposition, paroled as PLD, died, D, pardon, PRD, there's one that's exonerated, which is an E, and then and what the crime is, and you're going to see some common traits linking these. One is uh, arsenic, and another one is strychnine, uh, murder husband murder handyman, murder lover. Uh, you're gonna see some other interesting interesting commonalities too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with number number two, Rosa Schweistahl. I don't have a photograph of her. Um, Rosa lived on Woodward Avenue with her brother and she had met and fallen in love with a fellow named uh, Nicholas Schweistahl. And she was a little bit demure, didn't accept his marriage proposals right away, but uh, one Tuesday she did. And they agreed to set the date for the following Sunday. Apparently Nicholas was in a hurry. Tragically, unexpectedly, Rosa's brother dies on Thursday. She buries him and undaunted, she, she ties the knot with Nicholas on Sunday. Now, too late for Nicholas, but he started to hear rumors that the brother really wasn't the brother, but he was husband number one. So the police did an investigation. They took a look in Schweistall's in Rosa's residence and they found boxes and boxes and boxes of arsenic. They took her to a police station. And instead of denying it, she admitted to everything. She admitted to, uh, to feeding him smaller doses of arsenic, which is really how it, it would be done. She would feed small amounts of arsenic in coffee or tea or milk and it's got to be small doses because any big doses is going to leave bits of stuff floating on the surface and it will be taste bitter. Smaller doses and eventually the brain stem will be overwhelmed by the chemical and, and the, heavy, the heavy metal and a person will die. But in the interim, they'll experience symptoms that were like natural maladies, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, uh, chills. And those symptoms were the symptoms of influenza and streptococcus and, and typhus and diphtheria, typhoid, which is different than typhus. So if a killer really wanted to get away with it and make it look like mask it as a natural murder, it would be, it'd be arsenic. Um, so Rosa, Rosa is sentenced to life in prison, which amounts to what, 16 years. Now, not a tremendously villainous woman behind bars. In fact, she was older than all, all the other women and she was beloved she uh, 
took on a motherly role. In fact, she was so beloved that when she died, Nicholson, the, the, the warden, had a, had a ceremony right in the cell block uh, for her. Um, it's hard for me to condemn Rosa because she grew up in an era where where a man could legally be a woman with a stick. And who, who's to say that her husband wasn't a sadist and used the stick too often, you know? And, um, you just don't know. Um, number three, I know it's not Wayne County, but it, it's kind of an important point that I wanted to make about this. So Amanda Simmons nearly got lynched in 1869 for committing what many consider to be the worst case in Allegan County history. She led her three children down to the, to the river, the Kalamazoo River and drowned them and then laid the bodies out one by one, which a um, couple things about this are interesting. One is I'm talking about really old cases, but you're going to hear echoes all the way to the present because there's patterns in criminology. I mean, it's an old, it's the old saw history repeats itself. Well, it certainly did in this particular case, because there was a woman recently, um, I want to say her name was Smith, who uh, drowned her children by driving her car into a river or a lake. And if I remember correctly, people at the time, it was bandied about that she could be suffering from a really serious case of postpartum depression, which is a, a thing. It's a very serious thing. And I don't know. I mean, I had heard rumors that maybe there was a boyfriend involved. I mean, who knows why she did what she did. Point being, though, is that, you know, I, I hear that case and I think to myself, Amanda Simmons, it's it's an echo. You know, it's a it's a history repeating itself. But I also think to myself that you know, something was probably wrong in her mind. Something was broken for her to have done this and uh, mentally disturbed in some way, shape or form. Maybe maybe it was some form, some form of depression, but applying 21st century psychological terms like depression to a case from 1869 is like the ultimate example of Monday morning quarterbacking. They didn't, if you'd asked the detective, you know, if you told the detective that arrested her, the sheriff, you know, she was suffering from depression or she had fallen into a, a deep depression, he'd be looking for a hole on the ground because they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't have those terms. Um, but it is interesting. It's in, sometimes it's instructive and even kind of entertaining to use these terms and try to figure out what it is that made all the, these folks in this era tick. But uh, it, it's another example of where, uh, and this is a trap that historian, hi, historians and historical writers fall into, is you just can't assume that things the way they are today are the are, always were that way um, and that, that happens I, I've fallen into that trap I mean it's a very natural error to make um, so moving on Nellie Pope number 10 let's talk a little bit about her there she is um, they called her a statuesque beauty she was six foot four 200 pounds she's very very tall this is her photograph when she went to prison in 1895 and this is what she looked like when she got out in 1926 now Nellie Pope um was married to Dr. Horace Pope, who was a dentist, who ran a his dental business from the front studio of their house. I believe it was Woodward Avenue. Um, now he was quite a bit older than her, and when he was do, busy doing his his teeth drilling, Nellie had picked up two really bad habits. One of them is opium eating. She was an opium eater, which was their term for somebody who became addicted to opium-based products that, that could be purchased at pharmacies. Things like laudanum, uh, paragoric, uh, heroin, even uh, cocaine. I mean, all, all kinds of all kinds of things. The other bad habit she picked up was a a young barber by the name of Bad Billy Brousseau, who also happened to share her love of opium products. So she carried on an affair with, with Billy um, and uh, actually was so manipulative that she was able to convince her husband that she needed help around the house. And so she got her husband to hire her lover as sort of a manservant. And they carried on the affair right under the nose of the cuckolded dentist. And he wound up sleeping in the chair in the kitchen. Now, when the good dentist wasn't looking, Nellie had sent Billy around Detroit on two errands. One was to get their dope. The second one was to take out ever larger life insurance policies in the good dentist's name. And you know what's coming next. One dark and stormy night, I couldn't think quite literally, uh, Billy Brousseau tiptoed behind the dentist as he slept in the kitchen and hit him in the top of the head with an axe so, so hard it took the top of his head off. It, it scalped him. Then Billy, who I'm, I'm fairly certain was high at the time, uh, 
made his fatal error. A lot of these criminals make one fatal misstep. Harmatia, the Greeks would have called it. A tragic error in judgment. And in this case, he put the axe, the bloody axe, next to the chair. That was his undoing. He ran off to the nearest constable he could find, a beat walker, and told that was part of the plan, and told the cop that the dentist had found him in flagrante delicto with his wife and took a shot at him, and that he had no other choice but to defend himself. He had an axe in his hands, and he hit the, he hit the dentist in the, in the forehead with an axe. This constable came to the, to the scene of the crime, and there the body is in a radiate, you know, ever larger pool of blood. There's the axe. Now, it turns out that the dentist was bald in the front, but had hair in the back. And what do you know? What's on the, the, the axe tip? Coagulated blood with hair. That was all the forensic evidence that the police needed to prove that he had tiptoed behind the dentist and hit him in the back of the head. So, Billy, it, it's interesting to hear the, the, you know, the, the stories of, of his various confessions because he went through what we'd call the DTs. And uh, Billy turned state's evidence and said that Nellie was behind the whole thing. In fact, she was she engineered it right down to, to the to the story he told the constable. She was in the room when he did the dirty. So he went down for life. Her trial came next. She and I, she had a girl named Bernice, a daughter, and she told Bernice how to cry on cue. And so when there was a particularly uh, when she wanted to tug on the heartstrings of the all male jury she'd uh, have Bernice cry. But in, in, un, unlike um, some of the con artists, it didn't work and she got life in prison. So she goes off to Detroit House of Corrections and this is where her story really becomes fascinating to me. She, she sees ghosts, um, she's unruly, she beats up the other inmates. She's the reason why the con artist Ismay, Ismay Martin was terrorized behind prison, almost died in there. Uh, she refused to follow the silence rule she saw, uh, uh, spent several stints in solitary. My favorite, favorite Nellie Pope story is that she was, uh, the, the, the inmates were allowed to worship on Sunday. And the, the men, there was a bigger population, they worshiped from the floor. And the women, the smaller population, worshiped from the balcony up and behind them. And without provocation, without warning, Nellie took herself and flung herself over the balcony, right on top of the men. What would Freud say about that one? Nellie Pope. Now, often when I give this presentation, I'm asked who the wickedest woman in Detroit is. And, and I don't know, there, I mean, there's a lot of candidates for that. But to me, just based on what I know of her, she's right at the top of the list. Now, there's a lot more to the story and there's a lot more to the psychology here. And, you know, you might be looking at a sociopath if we were to apply a 21st century term to, to a case this old. Um, so very, very fascinating individual. Here's the page two of the list. Again, I'm going to kind of stick with, uh, I'm going to stick with the, the Wayne County cases, but you'll notice number 14, Caroline Collins from Shiawassee. Notice the EX pointer. Now, when you have a list of 34, you, you might have one. Odds are you might have one who's wrongly convicted, and that was Caroline Collins. Um, so uh, Wayne County, Caroline Becker, number 20, beat, uh, beat her best friend to death with a chunk of heating coal. And the motive for that crime was Caroline Becker believed her friend had had a mattress bank. She didn't trust banks and somewhere in the house was stashed all this money. In, in the end, she found it wasn't true. It was a rumor. And in the end, she found just two banknotes, a 10 and a five. She murdered her friend for 15 bucks. Now, granted, that was more money then than it is today, but 15 bucks, right? And she wasn't very careful about, about it either. She stuck the bloody money in her shoe and forgot about it. And that's exactly where the police found it. That was the smoking gun, if you will. Um, we'll get to Sarah Lewin, number 25. I think she's next. Yeah, no, now here, here's another, th this is a sociopath. I, I'm certain of it. Look at the, the, the eyes always, you know, this photograph. So she lived in a fantasy world. She was a milliner, uh, seamstress, skilled one, but she lived in a fantasy world. She told everybody she had $500 when she had $5 and using logic like that, she didn't have any trouble finding somebody to co-sign a loan for, for a mortgage which she promptly defaulted on. And her creditor had her thrown out of the house and had the locks changed. So she got, she decided to get even. She hatched a plot. She prowled his neighborhood and waited for his little son. I think he was six years old, Max, his name was, to go out on his velocipede, his tricycle, and then she nabbed him. She took him down to a swamp on the edge of, of Detroit then. 
and uh, stuffed his mouth full of leaves, stomped on his on his on his head. He had he had circular marks on his forehead that Corner didn't understand at first, but it turns out it was the heel of the shoe. And then and then she throttled him. She was caught. Um, a couple more photographs over. This is as she's being taken away. That hat, I guess, was a very special hat to her. She always got tried to be photographed in it. Um, in fact, she was wearing that hat in the neighborhood when she kidnapped the kid. And so there were witnesses to the kidnapping and, and it was the hat that kind of gave her away. Um, so she, uh, she was sentenced, sorry, she was sentenced to the Detroit House of Corrections. This is 1924. So she's, she goes into the old one and right around 1926, the, the, the structure was just getting old. I mean, it predated electricity is old plumbing. They built the new one in um, Northville. And because the, the old one had a reputation for being kind of a draconian place, I mean, the women were not allowed to use the yard until the last couple of years of, their, uh, of, the, of the, the structure's lifespan. So when they got to the new one, they were lodged in, in quarters that were uh, built by the Detroit architect Khan. And it functioned more like a college dormitory. The women were allowed to walk around and, and supposedly Sarah Lewin became quite fond of gardening while she was buying bars. Here's the last of the list, 30, uh, the, of the 34 women. Um, the Wayne County case is here, uh, 31. Um, Minerva Abbas was convicted for shooting her husband on some flimsy evidence, which led to her discharge later on. But the, the one that I think is just perfect for Motown is number 34. Ethel Walker got into an argument with a friend over a record collection and uh, apparently tempers ran high and she shot her. She shot him, shot her. Um, in a sentence that uh, 12 years, which was ultimately commuted. Um, you're going to notice before we carry on here, some, some kind of a startling patterns in all of this. Um, the most common, I think, 40% of these cases are uxoricide or women who are getting rid of loved ones. It could be a lover, could be a husband, boyfriend, um, and you're using heavy metal poison for it. I call it chemical divorce. Usually it's arsenic or strychnine. And, you know, the, the question is why is that the most common crime? Well, exoricide is a common crime anyways, but I think that it has a lot to do with the fact that um, divorce would have been something that would have not been very common or even socially acceptable. I think a woman could get a divorce, but I think she would be a pariah in her community. So a lot of them took a different way out. And, and then, of course, there's always the possibility that she was with an abusive husband in an era where they didn't really consider abuse abuse like we would today. And for some women, maybe, maybe you know, they're married to men, sadists even, who like to go to the stick often. And, um, you know, that, that maybe doesn't justify it. Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, it certainly explains it. Another thing that you're not going to see here is you don't see a lot of gunshots. Um there's one, a Minerva Abbas. Uh, there's a shotgun slayer. Although that would be that would be two. Another one you don't see a lot of is blunt force trauma. Uh, the Caroline Becker murder, found with a chunk of heating coal. But that's by and large. And, and edged weapons is another one you don't see. I can't think of any stabbing uh, deaths here. Uh, by and large, these are passive aggressive forms of murder strychnine and arsenic. And strychnine, the, these products were available all over the state as uh, rodent killers, rodenticides. The, the product with strychnine was called Paris Green and the product with arsenic was called Rough on Rats. And no, nobody, especially in agrarian communities would have even batted an eyelash if a farmer's wife had rolled up in a carriage to buy a pound of a rodenticide. Whereas other substances which were freely available, I mean, if they, they you know, there would have been a, there would have been tongues wagging about this. And so that would explain all the arsenic and the strychnine, plus these are pretty lethal substances. And, and strychnine was, I, they, they couldn't make green wallpaper without it. Um, uh, our arsenic, also in wallpapers, lots of stories in bigger cities like in New York City where they didn't have access to rodenticides as, as, as much access. You hear stories of would-be killers boiling the wallpaper to create a heavy heavy water with, uh, with arsenic and then using that to dose somebody. Um, 
Euphemia Mondich is number 32 on the list. No, she'd uh, really be more of a serial wife than a serial killer. The, the Detroit Free Press said she was married 18 times, but that's an exaggeration. These newspapers of this era are very highly sensationalized. I like to think of them as taking a spicy sport story and throwing on red pepper on top of that. Uh, she's married six times, I think. And she was married to a guy named Mondich. And she took a lover named Yudorovich, and she used Yudorovich to bump off Mondich. And then what do you know? Yudorovich disappeared. It was a little while before she became a person of interest, but when she did, they caught her trying to get, flee the country. And very much like, like uh, the earlier case I talked about, Rosa Schweistall, uh, instead of deny it, she admitted it all. She said that Yudorovich tried to rape her and she defended herself, shot him in the neck afraid of the consequences. So she buried the body under this structure here, which became known as the murder house or the murder cottage. She sat in the back seat of a car while the detectives shimmied underneath the crawl space, using his hands, cupped away dirt till he found a uh, femur and then another bone and then another bone. And by nightfall, they laid out a pretty good skeleton in the front yard. Now, I love this picture of these kids with these short pants, you know. Uh, can you imagine what they'd be thinking with this skeleton laid out in the front? Uh, yard of a neighborhood house if they're anything like my students are thinking this is so cool a real skeleton you know what wasn't so cool for euphemia is that the skull had a hairline fracture going right up the backside and there was a lead pipe buried next to the body and that didn't jive with the self-defense so they you know at the, at the trial they put the skull on the table right in front of her it was not uncommon to use body parts in in trials of that era and, and, and the jury take, took one look at that skull fracture and they realized that she hit him on the back of the head and that didn't exactly work with the whole idea that he was raping her and they gave her a life sentence. So now what's interesting about this life sentence is 20 years of the possibility of parole. She went in 1924. Now the first date is wrong. I got to change that. She, she died in 1961. So she spent 37 years behind bars, way longer. All those other sentences and those other 30, 34 women I mean, you'd, you'd be lucky to find one who did the full 20 years. Uh, Nellie Pope did, but she was a terror behind bars. You feel me, bondage? 37 years. It's really interesting. Another photograph of her. Um, very interesting individual. One, one could argue that in the top five wickedest women in, in Wayne County, Wayne slash Oakland slash Macomb County, uh, she'd be right, right up there. She'd be in the top five, I think. Um, I kind of talked about this a little bit, uh, so I'm going to kind of just go through this a little bit. But, you know, in, in this era, people could have got their hands on all kinds of stuff. These are drug labels from 1900 from E.M. Colson, Kalkaska pharmacist. I acquired these when I was researching the serial killer, Mary McKnight, I, was, I kind of began, began the program with. And the one that's interesting here is this paragoric. Now, there's paragoric, I think, floating around today, but it's not this paragoric. If you look at this stuff, it's it's... 46.5% alcohol, which is 93 proof. That's a strong cup of whiskey there. And then it's spiked with 1.9 grains of opium. Now look at the dosages. Three months old, five drops. And then it goes one year, 15 drops, and the adults get the full teaspoonful. Now this stuff is 40 years before the discovery of penicillin, or penicillium, which gave rise to penicillin, and it's off shoots like amoxicillin we have today. So back in this age, they weren't really, they weren't really curing the, you know, the underlying cause. They were just treating the symptoms, and you know, so they do with kids is they'd give, they'd give this stuff to them, you know, if they teethed, they'd rub it on the gums and, and numb it up really good. In fact, that's that's uh, cocaine was used that way. Pharmacies sold cocaine all the time in, in various concoctions that were designed uh, to be rubbed on the gums of teething children. Uh, it's kind of shocking when you think about it. Different world. Um, I'm going to skip forward a few. Um, so her name was Mel Mother Eleanor, uh, 1907. Um, her real name was Distabar, was her last name, but no one knew that. She came to Detroit and she ingratiated herself with a with a, uh, a religious cult called the Holy Rollers, literally the Holy Rollers. Now, what's interesting is she was espousing a philosophy about that was really a kind of a precursor to femininity. Um, I think uh, femininity is the wrong way to say it. Um, feminist movement, 
She kind of a kind of a her philosophy would have been a pioneer in the feminist movement. So way ahead of her time, but she she wasn't doing it to make a point. She was doing it to make a buck. And uh, she had convinced these holy rollers that she was the real deal. Um, and that uh, so much so that they figured their 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 mother, Eleanor, had to have fine jewelry to wear. She's being interviewed by a uh, journalist for one of the big three, you know, the news or the Detroit Times or the free press. I, I don't remember which. And the, the reporter said that she had this great big, huge uh, gemstone on her ring. And, and that what she would do during the interview is she would take her finger and sort of move the, the, the ring so that it kind of glistened in his eyes. And you see what she's doing here. She's very prominently displaying that ring. Um, it wasn't hers. It was one of the holy rollers that they lent her like $80,000 in 1907 dollars of, of, uh, of jewelry. Then one day she absconded and never to be heard or seen again, ever. In fact, to this day, Madame Dis de Bar's ultimate disposition is unknown. She just disappeared into the ether with all of that jewelry and all that money. And what happened was the finger of blame's got a point somewhere. And so they couldn't catch Mother Eleanor. So what they did is they, they ran a dragnet on fortune tellers throughout the city. Um, there was a city ordinance that said that fortune tellers could not advertise in the newspaper and no one ever enforced it. It was just kind of one of those old ordinances that just, you know, dated back. It's like, like there's a, there's a, some type of on the books is some law that said you in Detroit, you can't tie your pet alligator to a fire hydrant. Right. Well, who it's never enforced because what would be the need for it? But I'm sure at some point in time, somebody had an alligator and tied it to a fire hydrant and there was a fire and some firemen got bit or couldn't get the, the spigot open. So they had a, you know, put it on the books. Well, it's the same thing with these fortune tellers. I mean, in the, in the, in the Victorian era, spiritualism was a really big thing. Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, was a big spiritualist. They did seances. And so con artists would come in and use this to try to con people out of money, you know, and use their, their emotions, one, their desire to connect with dead loved ones and, and to, to make a dollar or two. But no one ever enforced the idea that they couldn't advertise in the newspaper fortune tellers until this happened. And then what happened, what, what, the, the, the police did a dragnet. They used Clara Langerink, who I showed you earlier, the matron. And they gave her a dollar and she would go to every fortune teller who, uh, who advertised and pay the dollar. And she got her fortune told and they were guilty of using the newspapers advertised and they took them away. And they ran people, literally ran people out of business. It was all because of this woman here, Mother Eleanor. Um, let's skip this one. Okay. This one. Um, this, this one is fascinating for a, a lot of different reasons. Um, you're looking at a, a wedding photograph. The tall fellow is a, a prosperous farmer by the name of Nay Ford, N-E-Y. And uh, the woman is a cabaret dancer from Toledo named May Blend. They met like a lot of folks, middle-aged folks did in that era. They met through what is known as a Cupid club or a matrimonial club where basically they'd pay a certain amount of money for a fee, for an entrance fee. And then they would give addresses of eligible uh, opposites they could exchange letters with. So these two kind of got into an epistolary romance. They exchanged letters. He was smitten with her. So he drove down to Toledo to, to meet in the flesh, so to speak. And it was love at first sight for Nay. And he told her, you know, it was not beyond him to lie. He told her that if she agreed to marry him, she'd never have to work another day in his life because he was, after all, a Ford. You know, Fords in Southeast Michigan? Well, there are a lot of Fords in Southeast Michigan, and they're not all related, at least not directly, to the, the auto Zion. So, um, but she had a bit of a gold digger in her, and, and, and so she said, I do. Now, when she got to Plymouth Township, um, she found out that her palatial estate was this farmhouse. And to may add insult to injury, she was made to cook meals for the, the servants. So Mabelin, Mabelin Ford now vowed to get even. Now, this was the Roaring Twenties, 1922. And she spent a lot of time in blind pigs, speakeasies, uh, blind pigs and unlicensed, you know, uh, saloon. Um, 
And uh, loose lips sink ships. Uh, drunks and babies tell the truth. Uh, she she blabbed about what she was about to do, and that was hire a hitman to get rid of Nay, Nay Ford. So she found one. His name was Kansas City Ed. I can't make this stuff up. I'm not that creative. She met Kansas City Ed in an in a, in a apartment in downtown Detroit. She passed this wedding photograph across the table and said, this is the guy. This is the mark. She passed over another document. It was a map of his milking barn. She told him that Nay is deaf in one ear. If you tiptoe behind him, he won't hear you coming. Brain him in the back of the head. And then take a pliers and pull all his teeth out. There's some real angst there. Also make identification difficult. Then she wanted uh, Kansas City Ed to take the body to another farm uh, barn, another barn and torch it. All the evidence of foul play would go up in smoke. It was a perfect plan. Kansas City Ed asked for the money, but she had forgot, uh, forgot to bring it. So they agreed to meet on the street the next day where she would pay him. Now, what she didn't know where her plan went awry is that Kansas City Ed, the hitman, was in fact Detective Ed Kunath of the Detroit Homicide Squad. See, Nay had heard her bragging about getting rid of him, and, and he went to the police. Kansas City Ed, Detective Ed Kunath. Now, he was, Kunath was no fool. He knew that she would try to worm her way out of it. So he had stationed two other officers behind the, the wall who overheard the, they peeled away some of the, the, the wallpaper and the lathing, and they had heard the entire conversation. There was no way that May Blen could say she didn't say it. She hires a lawyer, very, very good lawyer, to defend her at the conspiracy to commit murder charge uh, trial. It took place in 1922. Now, uh, in order, the lawyer had a very, very compelling argument. He had said that in order for a, a person to be guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, they had to make an overt act. Merely talking about it, and this had to be a winner with the all-male jurors, merely talking about it, killing your, your husband isn't an overt act, or, or he said, the lawyer said, a lot of Michigan women would be in real trouble. So what would have been an overt act? Paying him, paying the hitman. And Kunath must have known this because he asked for the payment. And they arrested, they arrested um, May when on the street when she was to meet and pay Kansas City Ed, but they arrested her without searching her. She didn't have the money on her. So they couldn't, they couldn't get her for that. And she beat the rap. There she is in her 20s era turban, leaving the court triumphantly. Now it's not a happily ever after for her, though. She snaps shortly after the trial under the stress of the trial and uh, spends the rest of her days in an in Indianapolis uh, mental institution. Okay, so I've been talking now for about an hour and 15 minutes, I think. So I'm, I'm getting to that, that point where I'm afraid that there's going to be Zoom fatigue or Zoom fatigue is going to kick in. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more and then I'll take whatever questions you have. So uh, my last two books, um, this Wicked Women of Detroit is number 10. This is number 11, Robert Irving Latimer, who was the longest tenured prisoner in Michigan history for a long time. Murdered his mother, it's called matricide. The crime is called matricide. It's, it never happens. It's like the blue diamond of criminology. Um, you just, just don't, don't see that crime very much. And it's an interesting story because with a Detroit connection, because he was a pharmacist from Jackson but he had run up huge debts because he come over to Detroit where he got very much involved in bordellos, spent all his time in bordellos, um, drinking, drugs, gambling, all of the vices. In fact, when he was tried, the madam of his favorite bordello actually testified to a very, very interesting situation that now he uh, was a pharmacist. So when he went to prison, he happened to go into the system at the same time of, as the entrance of a real lax prison administrator who allowed him to be the work in the pharmacy in prison. And he brought in all kinds of drugs. And one of the things he brought in was prusic acid, which is another name for cyanide. And he whooped up a batch of poison lemonade and killed a guy on his way out. So this is a fascinating story. Anyways, um, this is my, my 12th book, The Lonely Hearts Killers. Very, very famous case. Um, they were tried and uh, convicted in New York for a capital offense. What a lot of people don't realize 
that they were caught in Michigan for the murder of a widow and her 18 month old daughter. They were a weird situation where they were caught for one crime and extradited and convicted and sentenced for an entirely different crime in an entirely different state. And the reason why that came about in large part is because Michigan was debating a death penalty at the time, which failed. Had it passed, they would have never left Michigan, I don't believe, but it didn't, it failed. So Martha Beck and Raymond Fernandez, the infamous Lonely Hearts killers, and they, they met their, they got their name because they used these Cupid clubs uh, to, to meet lonely and unsuspecting widows with means. And then they'd steal stuff. And in some instances, they, they murdered them. So there I am in the historic prison of Mansfield. I got that off uh, the bucket list this last summer. My daughters and I went to Mansfield is where they filmed Shawshank Redemption. Mansfield, Ohio is one of the state, one of the prisons in the prison system in Ohio. It's uh largest freestanding steel cell block in the world. And you can go tour it. There's um, uh, solitary cells, which are really kind of creepy. And it's like kind of stepping into a movie set because they filmed the Shawshank there and they, they go over how they turned the prison into kind of like a kind of the movie. It's very fascinating. They have some of the sets there that they, they created. And, and if you're into ghost stories, it's supposed to be the, it's, and some people say the most haunted location in America. I like to keep my feet on the ground. You know, I don't generally like to fly off into the world of the ethereal, uh, although I like a good ghost story as much as the next guy. So for me, um, kind of an amateur penologist, I was more interested in the prison facets of it than the uh, than the ghostly residents. But, you know, it's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting thing to do. I do a big thing at Halloween. And anyways, um, it has been a great honor to speak with to you, all of you um, this evening. Positive word of mouth is my very best advertisement. So if you like what you heard, please tell libraries or other organizations, historical societies who'd like to host me. Um, I have lots of presentations, one for each book. Sometimes I have one on Michigan's Forgotten Serial Killers. Talk about a lot of cases. If you didn't like what you heard, don't say anything to anybody, please. <laughs> um, but Tobin, you, I see, Tobin, I see your website. You can, it's Mike Skinner. Yeah. Um, you, you, they can contact you uh, via email. Yep. Uh, or go to your website, and um, if, if you're interested in any of Tobin's books, uh, he's willing to uh, mail them to you, and you're, you'll pay the postage, but sell them at retail price, but sign them, right? Yeah, I have I have four books right now available. One is The Wicked Women of Detroit, which I spoke about tonight, of course. One is called The Shocking Case of Helmut Schmidt. That's about a serial killer from Royal Oak who also happened to be a World War I spy. He worked for Ford Motor Company um, and was passing information from the Highland Park plant over to the German embassy. Uh, I have the last two books I showed you, the, the Michigan the Michigan Matricide one about Irving Latimer and then the Lonely Hearts Killers. They're $20 each. If you if you buy multiple copies, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. or give you a break on that. Um, and I'll pay for postage. So you can pay me through PayPal or send me a check. Personal check's okay. If you just send me an email, tell me what you want and how in your mailing address and how you'd like me to personalize that i'll personalize and autograph it and send it right out to you so it, no it, Tobin, it sounds like the perfect christmas gift <laughs> yeah it, yeah absolutely absolutely so no no pressure though but if you're interested that's that's Very how right. you can order a book for me so well, let me let me uh let me go there's three questions um okay. just wondering if the women if any of the women who po uh, poison their spouses or partners were abused by these men is there was there any proof of that in any of these cases that didn't seem like it no because i well sarah quimby murdered her children and she tried to murder herself so basically she did she did a murder suicide she uh she spiked the wine with uh i want to say it was but she was certainly not someone that was abused by a spouse well i think she was actually she was married to a guy named a farmer named elmer quimby and I I think that there's a pretty good indication. He was sort of heavy handed with her. So she tried to kill her. She killed her children and then she was going to kill herself and she didn't have a heavy enough dose. But here's the thing with this. And here's why this is hard to prove. Back in that day, it wasn't considered really underhanded. You know, it wasn't considered inappropriate. And so the sources don't really go into, well, it was justifiable because he slapped her around because it was considered OK to do so. But you, you can kind of you read between the lines and you can kind of see some of these instances. And out of all the women I talked about, Sarah Quimby would be one that I'm, I'm almost convinced her husband was beating her. Okay. And then another question, uh, what sentence did Brousseau 
B-R-U-S-S-E-A-U get? He got life. So 20 years of the possibility of parole, but his he died of consumption in prison, I think after spending about 15 years inside. So he would have died um, like around 1905 and of consumption. So he died of tuberculosis. Okay. And then one of our uh, uh, attendees uh, or participants says, I'm interested in the details of the woman prisoner named Jenny Flood from Grand Rapids. Uh, what do the other information columns mean? Uh, for instance, the last entry uh, where it says Canada, does that mean um, that she was born in Canada? I assume that's the case, right? Yeah, that's nativity. Yeah. So Jenny Flood is an interesting case. She's a black widow killer. And I have a whole chapter written about her in a book called Murder and Mayhem in Grand Rapids. I don't have the book with me, but you can get that pretty easily on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or your local bookstore. Um, Very good. Yeah, there's a whole write up on that. Jenny Flood's an interesting case, really interesting, real, real twisted individual. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for, for, for attending uh, this program along with the others. Thanks to Adam and his uh, uh, technological ability will be put up onto the new YouTube channel. Uh, so it'll be available. And I uh, want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, whatever you celebrate uh, with the holiday season coming up. Please stay safe. And Adam, do we have anything final that you'd like to add before we uh, we end? Nope, just uh, follow our YouTube channel, uh, Gross Point Historical Society. You can search it right on YouTube and see previous presentations. Very good. Thank you again, Tobin. And My thanks, pleasure. everyone, for attending. Happy holidays. My Take great care. pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.